Thursday and welcome in for the latest Just a Bit Outside presented by Wafed Bank. Join a best bank at wafedbank.com. I'm Michelle Ledka and we've got a great show in store for you this week, including a one-on-one -on -one with Seattle's Mariners, Braden Bishop, his thoughts on becoming a father, how he's preparing for the unknowns of the 2021 season, plus his love of coffee. We also have got an all-new trivia segment with special guest Brooke Fox from Movin 92.5, an unheard sound from the Sounder season. But to start things off, let's have our experts weigh in on this week's hot topics from the sidelines. Joining us now on Just a Bit Outside, Aaron Levine, Spencer Haas, and Brady Henderson. Spencer, of course, the former Husky and NBA superstar. I know he won't want to call himself a superstar, but I'm calling him a superstar. And of course, Brady Henderson, our superstar reporter covering the Seahawks for ESPN. Guys, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. And now we were talking a little offline. We've got kind of a cool connection going on with this group. Yeah, in fact, Spencer and I went to elementary school together at St. Anne's. So this is the, the St. Anne's takeover edition of from the sidelines. So was Spencer filling in on the basketball court in first and second grade also? I'm guessing he was. Of course he was, yes. Yeah, I, th I think I was two years older than Spencer at St. Anne's, and he was, uh, he was beating me just as badly as you would expect him to. I uh, love it, you guys. All right, well, let's jump in on our first hot topic of this week's episode. Uh, we got to talk to Seahawks, and I want to talk about DK Metcalf. Obviously, we all know how amazing he has been on this field this season, but some stood out to me in the last game, the win over the Jets, his touchdown celebration, him jumping over, taking over a camera, then his like teammates awkwardly were like giving him a birthday gift. Let's dissect it. Thoughts on all of this? Pete Carroll obviously was not like super thrilled because there was a penalty involved. I'll be a serious sports fan first. I'm glad he did it against the Jets, a game where a penalty like that could have really cost them a game. I mean, in some form uh, or another. I mean, in general, though, if DK wants to apply as a cameraman here at Q13 Fox, I think we should take his application seriously as long as he doesn't take his shirt off during the interview process like he did with the Seahawks at the Combine. I think he might have a really good job, time getting that job. But, you know, in general, I think the NFL has done a really good job in letting teams and players be creative after touchdown celebrations or turnover celebrations. Different than they once were. It used to be called the No Fun League. Now you can be creative without using props. So hopefully DK Metcalf learned his lesson there and won't ever use a camera or another prop in this situation. Well, yeah, I, I think he should stick to his day job. I saw some of the footage of the camera that he took over and it was a little wobbly. Wasn't really focused on any one thing in particular. Um, no, I mean, I, some people, it sounds like, had something of a problem with it. But I'm with you, Aaron. If you're going to do that, you know, it's, I guess, do it in a game like that that was out of hand uh, against the Jets. And, you know, really... I, there was some conversation about is this sort of concerning about him, and I, I really think that's kind of a step too far. I mean, he, he has that, – that celebration definitely had some Terrell Owens, Chad o Ocho Cinco flair to it, but I think he has not been any sort of a diva over his first couple of years. He's actually been – sort of had a lot of anti-diva qualities, so um, I, I don't – I think it's much ado about nothing. You're right, Brady. He's as mature as they come, has a fantastic head on his shoulders, and any mistake he makes – he makes up for going forward. He never makes the same mistake twice. Yeah, it seemed to me like kind of fishing for a storyline in a game that didn't have a lot of them. I think it's, <laughs> it's fun to see the personality come out. And, and you know what? It's, it's kind of the age-old rule of professional sports. Your leash is as long as your production. And when you're producing like he does, you're going to have to tolerate uh, some of the other stuff. And especially an incident as you know, inconsequential as that, I don't think people should get too bent out of shape about it. But really, the real question here, is there another professional athlete that can rock a crop top as well as DK? I think that's for a different roundtable, Michelle. I'm not the fashion expert. That's, that's for a uh, – you might, you might I mean, need a, I mean, a different, uh, different analyst for that one. I mean, Ezekiel Elliott, the, the Dallas Cowboys running back, he likes to rock the crop top, rock, rock the crop top say that five times fast. Uh, but, yeah, I think DK probably wears it better. If we're asking who wore it better, I think DK did. 
Okay, okay. We'll save that one for another edition and, you know, whatever. I appreciate I appreciate the tempo on that one, guys. I mean, the crop top, it's, it's a tough one to pull off. But moving on to our next topic, the NBA season is about to start again next week. We've seen some preseason games. Spencer, I'm really curious about your thoughts on this one. Obviously, a much shorter offseason uh, than we've pretty much ever seen um, in this sport, but also they're moving away from the bubble format that we saw in 2020. You know, they're only releasing the first half of the schedule instead of the whole schedule. Like, give me your thoughts on how the NBA is trying to bring about a 2020, 2021 season. Well, I think they're doing their best. They're putting their best foot forward, trying to stay on somewhat of a traditional schedule and, and timeline uh, in terms of getting back to, you know, not having to play all the way through, the summer months, be able to have a more regular pre-draft process and, and playoffs and everything that goes along with it. But obviously it's like everybody else right now. They're, they're learning on the fly. They're adapting on the fly. And, you know, it's going to be tough for the teams that had long runs in the bubble, uh, but like it is every year. And then, you know, you have another third of the league that hasn't played a game since basically last March. So it should be interesting to see uh, how teams respond, how some of those younger teams that have been out for a while, uh, if they can, take advantage of being able to hit the ground running and get some games on some of the teams that I would be willing to better probably going to be resting a lot of guys early and uh, the load management issue. I think we'll be seeing a lot. That's not going anywhere, at least this season. So buckle up, get ready for that. I, I like that they're going to try to do, you know, 72 games, which is only 10 fewer games than uh, the regular season would have. And just comparing that to the way that the baseball season went. And I know that every league is doing the best it can, like Spencer said, but it just didn't really feel like a baseball season considering it was, uh, you know, a little over a third of the normal length. I think 72 games, hopefully they can pull it off, but that would feel much more like an actual season. And I also like the fact that they are still including, even though they're not in the bubble, they still have the, um, what's it called? The anonymous tip line, AKA uh, the snitch line. And it's, it's fun to joke about, but I actually, I mean, look, that's their livelihood, and it's their health is on the line, too. And I know if I was in that situation, I, I would want some mechanism like that uh, to at least try to hold other players accountable. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the, uh, the leaked Adam Silver, Tom Cruise impersonation <laughs> when, someone, when someone goes ahead and, and, and breaks the protocol. But to your point about 72 games, I've always kind of felt like that was a sweet spot uh, that, that the league could shoot for. I remember uh, in one of my first seasons with a lockout, we had it shortened. Uh, to, I believe, 60. And in the condensed time frame, I thought that was a little bit much. But I think ultimately, shaving off a few games and having a little more space in between them, I think could be good for the league. And I think this could be a, an opportunity to test run that number and see if they can get everybody. Uh, I don't think the players will be an issue getting them on board, but the teams, the sponsors, uh, the TV partners, and, and what have you, uh, to produce ultimately a better part, uh, product at the, at the end of the day. And in a more realistic amount of games for the, you know, for the constrained schedule that they have to plan in. Uh, Spencer, to your point, can we get Tom Cruise to give a big rant about why the Sonics don't have a team in Seattle anymore? I mean, still 12 years now. Uh, at this point, I'm kind of more worried about the NHL season and when it's starting next year. So, and how that might affect the Kraken's first season next October. Uh, to have gone long, this long without a team is it, really unfortunately turned me off to the league. At this point, I, and I was born and bred a, a Lakers fan, and I'm excited that they won a championship last year. But really, the only thing that would get me excited again is to either Sonic, see the Sonics again or maybe see LeBron James play with his son one day in the NBA together because that would be a lot of fun too. Yeah, I mean, I think in a weird way, a positive that could come from it is obviously the league uh, and, and everybody involved with it has lost a lot of money uh, throughout the process. They were able to rekindle some of it, being able to to run the bubble as successfully as they did. But at the end of the day, the easiest way to infuse cash quickly into the pockets of the rest of the owners is the expansion fee. And I think I read the kind of the current estimate would be around a billion dollars, and I'm sure they could milk out more than that. So I think uh, as a potential, you know, it's, it's weird to say benefit from all this uh, and every, you know, all the fallout that's been created from, from the last uh nine months it could potentially accelerate that process and i think everyone around here would be would be thrilled to see that the last topic today you guys we've got to talk about it um kind of the pac-12 football season as a whole started obviously so late up and down are they going to play are they not going to play we've seen teams that have only had like three games the ch championship game is supposed to be friday between oregon and usc 
the league announced it while teams were still playing last weekend and then the Huskies had to pull out and there's just there's so many layers to this your thoughts on how the Pac-12 is kind of uh I'm excited this one's loaded um but how the Pac-12 has handled the football season very on brand to me uh I think my bar has been set so low with regards to the uh the management and the leadership at the at the conference and at that level that I didn't expect much but uh I also didn't expect them quite to screw up uh, the championship situation as much as they did with, with all the back and forth and, and not giving Colorado an opportunity when the Huskies couldn't play and all the chatter from the Duck fans about how the Huskies backdoored into it only to take advantage of a similar situation at the end of the day. So uh, it's a cluster. I think everybody knows that. And, and I just wish that there was a little more national attention being paid to how badly Larry Scott and his cronies have ran the league as a whole into the ground and more specifically this last football season, how poorly they've managed that starting with getting uh, kicking off, you know, however many weeks, months later than the rest of the competition and then everything that's kind of transpired since. This season should have started back in September. It would have given so much more flexibility to the schedule. Instead, you have teams playing just two or three or four games, and you're trying to determine division championships after that. It's not fair to the student athletes who work just as hard as any other school in this country in a football program. Uh, to your point, Spencer, my, my nickname for Larry Scott is officially Mr. Tone Deaf. And I could come up with a lot worse than that. The fact that he still is one of the highest paid commissioners among the Power Five commissioners is, is beyond me. The network he created, it can't be seen across the country, not on direct TV, not AT&T. It's a laughing stock, terrible kickoff times, terrible tip-off times. The accessibility and the exposure of this conference is by far the worst of any Power Five conference out there. And the officiating continues to be horrible as well. So, I mean, there's not much good that could be said about Larry Scott as a commissioner. And I call him tone deaf because he's already talking about his potential next contract. Uh, aside from all that, though, all that that you just mentioned, it sounds like he's doing a nice job, though, right? No, I'm... I'm <laughs> I'm curious. I, I'm a little out of my lane here talking about college sports and you guys are the, uh, the Pac-12 guys. So I'm curious what you think of why, I mean, it seems like as long as Larry Scott has been in that position that it's kind of been a disaster. And I'm, I'm, I've always been curious, what has he done well to, to stay in that role? Uh, I'd have to do some research on that one. The very first television deal that he did with ESPN and Fox, I think the $3 billion deal, he was an outsider that came from, came from the Women's Tennis Association, didn't really know too much, but he knew a lot about TV deals at the time, and that was a blockbuster deal right off the bat. For the last five or six years, though, I think the university presidents that have sort of okayed him being in that position and the chancellors have sort of looked the other way, and they haven't held him accountable to some of the things that he's done. I mean, you watch – Read any John Canzano's articles from the Oregonian, and it'll just list step by step all the things that Larry Scott has taken advantage of as commissioner, and he clearly isn't deserving uh, based off of his performance over the past decade. Fire Larry Scott, please. <laughs> Do your job, champ chancellors. And I think that is the perfect place to end this and wrap this up today, you guys. I appreciate the insight. We hit a lot of things. Um, I love your expertise. Spencer, Brady, thanks so much for joining me. And Aaron, Aaron, as always, love your insight too. And we'll have to have you guys back again for another edition of Just a Bit Outside because we love your hot takes from the sidelines. Our next guest played baseball for the University of Washington before being drafted by the Seattle Mariners. He goes above and beyond on and off the field with his charitable work, and he's a guy you just can't help but root for. I'd like to welcome in Braden Bishop to Just a Bit Outside, of course, the former Husky and a Seattle Mariners outfielder. Braden, it's so good to see you. Thanks for taking some time to chat today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course, first of all, congratulations are in order because you and your beautiful wife are expecting a little baby boy. That is so exciting. I know. We're, we're definitely excited. It's going to be a upender for life, but <laughs> we'll figure it out. How has that process been preparing for your first child? I mean, I guess just asking a bunch of questions, uh, you know, guys who have had babies or, you know, obviously our parents. Uh, <laughs> What most people say is either get your sleep now, which scares me because I love my sleep, or, uh, you know, people say you figure it out on the fly. It's not as hard as, you know, people make it out to be. So I guess we'll find out. I guess it's so personal, you know, how your baby 
you know, sleeps and eats and the, you know, timeline of all that stuff. So, you know, I'm just praying that he's a sleeper. Well, obviously this has been a very strange year for all of us. Um, you specifically in baseball, I mean, have you had time in the last couple of months to reflect on like, what a strange, almost historic baseball season you were able to be a part of? Yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's still kind of crazy, like, thinking back on it and just, like, routines past years compared to this year was just so different. Uh, you know, obviously, in the position I was in where I was going back and forth from Tacoma and Seattle, and it was like, you know, in Tacoma, you you can only play as many innings as you had pitchers. And once they, you know, reach their innings for the week or for the month or whatever, uh, you know, that was it. So you could really only do so much. And because you only had so many players, like there wasn't a uh, high double AA, triple A. Uh, and, and then you go up and you face big league competition. And it's just like, you, it's hard to prepare yourself without playing guys. Cause that's like the beauty of triple A is like, you have so many guys who have been up and down and, you know, have stuff to be up there and you fate your face them every day so then when you do get the call it the, the gap's a little closer where this one you're facing you know really good prospects but they don't know how to pitch exactly the same as guys in the big leagues or even triple a so that was definitely interesting and then you know obviously adapting to the the times and you know having to be aware of you know, distancing and wearing your mask and taking care of the guys around you. Cause I think as you've seen in all sports is like, I mean, UW's going through it right now. You know, their football team is like a couple guys get it and you don't mean to give it to everybody else, but you're around each other. And next thing you know, it spreads and, you know, then opportunities kind of pass you by and obviously you can't really control it, but you know, that's kind of like the most important thing that, a lot of I think we did a really good job of it so um, yeah it was interesting though. Okay. Now for you kind of looking forward or mirror ahead I should say to the future I mean I know there's a, quite a few question marks uh, with Major League Baseball in general I mean sports in general of what 2021 is going to look like but how are you handling this off season? are you going kind of about like business as usual when it comes to like getting your body right for spring training without really knowing if there's going to be normal spring training or like how are you handling that I guess a little of both you know like being realistic to know that times obviously aren't going to be back to normal come spring training so getting ready you know for that level of competition but at the same time earlier this year and especially with like that layoff we had from April to end of June or whatever it was yeah I felt like I kind of like rode the uh, emotional roller coaster of like everything I heard, everything that's written. You know, like, am I gonna have to be ready at the drop of a hat? When's it gonna happen? Like, you know, it's gonna happen. What's it gonna look like? And then I felt like when it did happen, I was just kind of all over the place because I had been riding this crazy roller coaster. So I think for for this, I'm just gonna <laughs> you know, let myself adjust to whatever you know, whatever it looks like. I think the nice part realizing it last year is like even though there was no fans in the stands. Once you step in between a line, the game was the exact same. Um, you know, you're facing the same competition. It's the big leagues. You know, it's baseball. And you just kind of get lost in that. So to know that that feeling is, is out there, you know, it makes, like, getting ready for that easier because it's the game. Um, and then everything around us, I guess it'll take care of itself. And people who are in a lot better paid positions than me can make those decisions. You and me both, my yeah, friend. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but baseball inside, you've got tons of other things going on in your life. I mean, obviously, I love following along with all the amazing charitable work you do, if it's even from your own charity with the great work you've been doing with Alzheimer's in honor of your late, beautiful mother to the stuff in the local community here up in Seattle. But kind of also on top of this, during a pandemic, while playing professional baseball, you launched a coffee company, Cognition Coffee Company. Tell me about that. Where did that come from? Well, you know, I've always kind of had a a knack for just like business. And, you know, I took a few classes when I was at UW. Um, And then I love coffee. I have a maybe slight addiction. And, you know, like it's just, you know, a hobby 
when the pandemic hit, I realized that, you know, I had an, an opportunity to look into it at least and see, you know, what it entails. Cause you know, like, you know, blue bottle coffee, for example, which is like a pretty big national brand. They started in San Francisco, I believe, but they went, ended up selling their company for $425 million. So I, I knew coffee and obviously, you know, everybody pretty much drinks coffee uh, at least once a day. So I knew that obviously there's a market for it. And then as my mom was going through Alzheimer's, I realized how much of a health benefit uh, coffee was just to your brain in general. And then obviously now you see all these companies like infusing their coffee with like uh, medicinal mushrooms and all these things like boost your cognitive performance. And so I just kind of looked into it and realized that it actually wasn't as big as an upfront investment as I thought it would be. Uh, at least to start on like a small scale like I did. And then I wanted to tie it in with the charity just so people felt good about when they would buy some coffee, like there would be go to a good cause. So uh, $1 from every purchase goes back to the four mom charity. You know, so it's slowly grown. You know, we sold out of like our first order, like inventory, uh, like a week ago during Black Friday. Um, and then it's just like helped me get creative, you know. Um, and then, you know, I'm hoping like as it continues to grow, maybe a coffee shop or cafe down the road, you know, I would love, I guess like in my perfect world, it would be play baseball until I can't anymore. And then open a cafe, like a, a small cafe coffee shop. I love it. How fun. It's got to be yeah. such a great creative outlet for you and everything. And I mean, you've got the Seattle ties, which let's be real. Seattle's like what the coffee capital of the yeah, world. Exactly. Um, <laughs> do you have a favorite coffee shop in Seattle right now? Ooh, I like really like, too? I liked, um, Mr. West cafe. Um, I love avocado toast too. So they have a good one there. Um, yeah, I would say that that's probably my favorite, like, go-to. It just sucks because it, it, you know, it takes, like, 15 minutes to get from the stadium to there just with traffic in the city. So that kind of sucks. But, uh, yeah, I would say that. And then, obviously, Starbucks if you need it quickly. Yeah, on every corner. Got to love that. Yeah, but exactly. You definitely have your options in Seattle. That's so fun. So I like this plan. Let's have you play baseball for a very long time with the Seattle Mariners. Yeah. Um, I say let's add a World Series to that yeah. list. And then um, I'm going to put right now my, my take that I think this coffee cafe that you want to make should serve avocado toast and should <laughs> yeah. yeah. That sounds like a perfect world to me. Life plan figured out. That's yeah, what this exactly. segment should be called. Figuring yeah. out your life with Michelle. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Braden, I every time we get a talk, I just enjoy it so much. You're just you're such a joy to watch on the baseball field and everything you do in the community. And I just feel like us here in Seattle are so lucky to get to have you with the Mariners. Um, I wish we could go on so much longer, but our time's up. But thank you so much for taking the time and best of luck the rest of this off season and with fatherhood and, and, yeah. and all the good things going on in your life. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's always a joy. And I hope you have a Merry Christmas with your family. And you can learn more about Cognition Coffee at CognitionCoffeeCompany.com. Aaron Levine joining me now. And Aaron, you and I have both had the pleasure of doing several stories with Braden over the years. Every time I speak with him, I'm just reminded, like I said on that interview, how lucky we are as Seattle sports fans to have this kind of a caliber of athlete and human representing our city. Yeah, no doubt about it, Michelle. Uh, Braden Bishop, though, is going to have to drink a lot of his own coffee when he's expecting the newborn. Uh, say goodbye to sleep. He likes sleep. Say goodbye to it all. If I could uh, have as much sleep as I've lost over the last four years, I'd probably end up like Rip Van Winkle. So uh, have fun and congratulations, Braden. I love it, Aaron. Yes, get all the sleep you can can, Braden, before little, little baby Bishop comes along. Well, switching gears, it's time for Emerald City Extras, where we dig through press conference sound to bring you stuff that just didn't quite make it into our sports cast. And this week, we have just one soundbite, because really, I think it's the soundbite that encompasses this year in sports. It comes from Sounders uh, general manager, Garth Lagerway. He met with the media following the Sounders season, was all over, and he was asked about the hardships and kind of the future for the club. He acknowledged that there is a much bigger issues in the world than what the Sounders have had to deal with this year, but also pointed out just how badly this club misses their fans. The thing that we miss the most is the fans. It's, it's you know, 
I would drive into the stadium and watch the game. And the only reason I share that with you is, uh, you know, it felt like, and, and, you know, some of you guys in the media are, you know, had a similar experience, I mentioned, but it felt like I am legend. Like, like it was just barren and empty in downtown Seattle and you're pulling your car into the Lumen Field garage and, you know, there's four cars there in, you know, in a, a space that's usually jammed and you're walking down long, massive corridors all by yourself and sitting in a section of the stadium and you're hearing the sound echo around. And I mean, it's just a bizarre experience from a pro sports perspective. And, you know, again, I, I credit to ECS and our fans, you know, they did a great job in the South end and the Brom end, you know, to, to put up supportive banners. We played a year ago, what I still think was the coolest sporting event in my life. You know, the, when we hosted MLS cup, uh, and and I, I get chills still just thinking about that. And when you contrast that to being in Columbus in front of 1,500 people, you know, and a credit to those folks that came out to that game, they, I think they did a great job to provide atmosphere there. But it's just, you know, you couldn't have a better illustration of the year than juxtaposing those images. 70,000 in Lumen Field, 1,500 in Columbus. And, man, I, I hope next year we get back to the point where we can have 70,000 in, in Lumen Field again. Garth Lagerway absolutely nailed it right there. I also love the I am legend reference, except the next time I go to Lumen Field and there's nobody there, I'm worried that Will Smith is going to jump up from around the corner with some big machine gun or some sort of weapon uh, and surprise me out of nowhere. But see, if you go with this whole analogy, Aaron, it's okay if we see Will Smith. Like, that would be a plus. <laughs> we just don't want, like, the zombie, weird yes. creatures. That, that movie right there turned more me people. completely. Yes, more people, no zombies. And yeah, there we go. All right, <laughs> well, let's, that's it for Emerald City Extras. Uh, because coming up next, we've got an exciting guest on the clock coming up. So Aaron, we'll check back with you in a second because Aaron still remains undefeated as our trivia master. But will that be the case after today? A special guest, like I said. So let's find out how it all played out with the help of Jessamyn McIntyre. Well, this has been a few years in the making because we're now joined by Brooke Fox of Brooke and Jeffrey in the morning on Moving 92.5. Hey, Brooke. Hi, my friend. Well, Hello, you are friend. also you're also very festive today. I, am, I, love I, am. I, I was really excited about my shirt. Jose got me this shirt. And if you can <laughs> see, it says 2020 was abominable. <laughs> and it had face masks and a little hand sanitizer up here. And then even a little coronavirus. You are prepared. I, I, I think am. you can wear that every go. day for the rest of this month. That's great. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a very suited shirt. Well, this, the inspiration of this On the Clock segment comes from Winbrook's Bucks, which you can hear at 8.50 every morning on 92.5. How are you? Are, are you? are you managing everything through the pandemic? I am. I think I've gotten, I think I've gotten dumber, though. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> but I don't know if it's the copious amounts of wine that I've been drinking over the past year, but... You know, we're doing good. It's like, you know, it's, it's good. It's all good. So we have we have the built in excuse ahead of time. That's good. I feel the same way. You yeah. were also gracious enough to have me in studio to face you on Winbrook's Bucks a few years back. So it's only appropriate for me to return the favor. And while I don't want to be overly accommodating, I, I still want to win. <laughs> OK, I, you know, I'm competitive. So bring it. How, how are you doing this? How's it working? OK, so each of us has a minute to answer as many questions as possible. You okay. have to beat me outright to win. It's home field advantage, home turf this way around. Um, I also want to mention that these trivia questions are provided by our friend, the fish, Jeff Aaron's Fame Trivia USA. So be sure to check out them at uh, Fame Trivia USA on Facebook. Uh, Brooke, I'm going to give you the honors here. I'm going to take my earphones out. I'm actually going to play some music on my other headphones right here. I don't know if you can hear it. I guess I'll trust you. you, you go know. ahead. Well, here. I got some uh, Justin Timberlake going on over here. So I'm taking this out. Our Jessamyn McIntyre is standing by. Jessamyn. Oh, like... <laughs> All right, I'm ready. Okay, Brooke, get ready. Your challenge is about to begin. You are officially on the clock. Okay. Since 1914, whose face has braced the $100 bill? Jackson. Nope. Which candy bar is described in its advertising as simply peanuts in milk chocolate? Baby Ruth? Which famous singer had a backup band also known as the Wailers? Pass. On what type of truck will you find the famous bulldog ornament? Ford. 
Fandango is a website to buy movies, but to people in Spain and Portugal, what is a Fandango? Uh, movie ticket. In the standard game of jacks, how many prongs are on each jack? Nine. In which U.S. state gets to call itself the heart of Dixie? Mississippi. When driving a standard or transmission car, what floor pedal is in the middle? Accelerator, brake, or clutch? Uh, clutch. Okay, that will do it. Oh, we God. Are that was terrible. I didn't know. I'm going to tell you, that was pretty tough. My brain is a little fried. Okay. Okay. Well, I, my, my brain's always fried, so let's see how we do here. Okay. Okay. Aaron, resetting the stopwatch here. You are officially on the clock. Since 1914, whose face has graced the $100 bill? Ben Franklin. Which candy bar is described in its advertising as simply peanuts in milk chocolate? Uh, Baby Ruth. What famous singer had a backup band also known as the Wailers? Oh, uh, Bob Marley. On what type of truck will you find the famous bulldog ornament? Pass. Fandango is a website to buy movie tickets, but to people in Spain and Portugal, what is a Fandango? A dance. In what's in the standard game of jacks, how many prongs are on each jack? Uh, seven. Which U.S. state gets to call itself the heart of Dixie? Uh, Mississippi. When driving a standard transmission car, what floor pedal is in the middle? Accelerator, brake, or clutch? Brake. Who sang top 40 hits for such original movie soundtracks as Caddyshack, Top Gun, and Footloose? Oh, um, uh... Uh, uh, this is the last one. Okay. All right. You uh, are good to go. Um, Brooke, I'm so sorry, but you didn't get any right. Uh, Aaron did get four correct. Oh, no. Uh, I didn't get one right. Brooke, this isn't sure. over. The, the grudge matches will continue. I promise. It's hard being on this side, you know? <laughs> I never go first. I just, you know, like kind of ease my way into saying, that's all right. That's all right. As long well, as you don't take my money, I'm good. No, yeah, well, I, I did last time. So hopefully yeah. <laughs> next time around, I'll, I'll win it for another one of your listeners. I know you have a ton of them out there. Be sure to listen to Brooke and Jeffrey in the morning on Moving 92.5. Thanks so much for joining us oh, this week. Oh, you did great, my friend. Congratulations. Happy holidays. You too. So here are the answers. Ben Franklin is on the $100 bill. Mr. Goodbar is known as simply peanuts and milk chocolate. It was Bob Marley and the Whalers. The Bulldog ornament is on a Mack truck. And the Fandango is a dance. Remember Bohemian Rhapsody? There are six prongs on a jack. Alabama is the heart of Dixie. Neither of us got that right. The break is in the middle. And Kenny Loggins sang the soundtracks of Caddyshack, Top Gun, and Footloose. Michelle Brooke kills it on the air every morning. She's so good every day. I'm just chalking it up to a bad day. I guess everybody has them. Everybody does, Aaron. And while you may have won the trivia game today, Brooke killed the sweater game. I love that sweater. I might have to buy one myself. Now, if you want to take on Aaron and be a part of On the Clock, just head over to Twitter and send a note to Aaron at AaronQ13Fox for your chance to join us on the show. And before we wrap things up on this week's Just a Bit Outside, let's take a look at the headlines we are tracking by checking in on the top storylines brought to you by Wafed Bank. Get free checking at a best bank, wafedbank.com. First, you heard it mentioned earlier, but the Huskies had to pull out of the Pac-12 championship football game due to COVID. Oregon will now take on USC for the title. The Seahawks can clinch a spot in the playoffs with a win over Washington this Sunday. And lastly, the Sounders have announced they have re-signed Nicholas Ladero, and he will now be with the club through 2023. Let's bring Aaron back in now. And Aaron, we've been doing pretty good with these picks. I'm interested to hear your picks for this week in Against All Odds. Uh, Michelle, this entire football season has been really, really lucky for us because I swear, I don't know what I'm doing, but we keep finishing with winning weeks. I guess that's kind of how it works. We're now 23 and 14 against the spread for the season, which is over 62% winners. Last week, we went 3 and 2. We lost with the Patriots and Wisconsin. We won with Minnesota plus 10 at Nebraska. The Colts beating up on the Raiders and the Chargers covering just barely by half a point against the Atlanta Falcons. So this week, 
I'm sticking with the Chargers because I always love them as an underdog. Speaking of which, I always love Stanford as an underdog. I'll take Ohio State to blow out Northwestern in the Big Ten title game. And back to the NFL, if the Saints don't have Drew Brees back, I love the Chiefs to cover this one easily. And the Panthers might be 4-9, and nine, but only two of those nine losses have been by more than nine points. So I feel pretty good taking nine points in Carolina at Green Bay. So uh, there you go, Michelle. I love it, Aaron. Can't wait to see how all those play out. Love your insight and all that as well. And I don't think you can give yourself enough credit. You definitely know what you're doing. <laughs> the, the record shows it. Well, that does it for this episode of Just a Bit Outside, presented by Wafed Bank. Join a Best Bank. A huge thanks to Braden, Spencer, Brady, and Brooke for joining the show. For Aaron Levine and our entire production crew, I'm Michelle Ledka. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll see you next week.